This morning, we are honored and privileged to be addressed by Mr. Walter Speer. I first met Mr. Speer almost 10 years ago when my husband became the rabbi of the Mount Sinai Jewish Center in Washington Heights. Mr. Speer and his wife, Carla Speer, have been mainstays of that shul and that congregation for decades. And we got to know them as the veteran members of the community who taught us the young new rabbi and rabbits in the ropes. But later I got to know Mr. Speer's remarkable story. He spent his childhood in Germany, where he firsthand was a witness to the events of Kristallnacht in 1938. He is a survivor of the Holocaust, and his firsthand story includes a remarkable narrative of a US Army officer who liberated him, helped him, and looked out for him after the war. You will hear that and more of that remarkable story when Mr. Speer speaks to all of us this morning. And so today's commemoration honors both the memory of the 80th anniversary of Kristallnacht, as well as a celebration of the heroism and the sacrifice of those who wear the uniform of the United States military. Please give Mr. Speer your undivided attention. Thank you for the introduction. Regardless how often I speak, there are certain spots where we get a little emotional. Please forgive me. When Hitler came to power, I was six years old. I, I was the youngest of five. We lived a normal life. My father, my grandfather built the Rabban in 1891 in our town. When Hitler came to power, I was young. I didn't know what this means, but very often Jewish people came to our house. My father was talking, oh, he won't last, we will stay. But unfortunately, it never worked out that way. In 1938, on a Monday or Tuesday, a policeman came to my father and said, Mr. Spear, I give you a good advice, disappear. When the politician dies in France, I have to take I have to arrest you. It was a shock to all of us. My father disappeared. I was the only one home. My oldest father, a brother, since we also had farming, went out west and far in Germany, out west to learn the farming. Everybody was in a different place, and I was the only one left. But on Thursday or Wednesday, my oldest brother came home. Sure enough, came Wednesday late in the afternoon. The SS came and said to my mother, where's your husband? While he left, Yesterday afternoon on business and he never came home. But they knew that my brother, my oldest brother, was here. And they asked, where is Julius? So my mother said, he's out in the field and working. P.S. The SS went out in the field and took my brother to Buchenwald and so many others. Came at night time, but I must say a lot of Jews from our, our town came to our house 
and we closed our shutters because we knew something is going to happen. Sure enough, came nighttime. Unfortunately, or fortunately, we had all shutters around the building, only one window. So they knocked in the window. Came around three o'clock, my mother said to me, now don't forget I was younger than I'm sure than any one of in this room. My mother said to me, why don't you go to Uncle Adolf where our papa is? So since I was the only one home, it was about three kilometers, I ran through the fields and I knocked on the door by my relatives. And sure enough, my grandmother opened up the door and said, thank God that you're here. How is my rest of the family? I said, everybody is fine. In the meantime, my father came up from the cellar, wherever he was, and naturally he kissed me. And I said, everybody all right? And I said, I got to go back home and got a report to my grandmother. Before I left, my father benched me, my grandmother benched me, and sure enough, I went back to, through the woods home. But that time was a little bit... Uh, got a little bit light, but again I ran through the woods and I reported that everything is all right. I went to public school at that time and I didn't go. A couple of days later, I did go to public school, but the teacher pushed me in the back and he never called on me. And when the time to go home, I rushed home because otherwise they would have beat me up. A couple of weeks later, all my siblings came home. And my oldest brother came home from Buchenwald and he said, I have two weeks to leave the country. And there was such a thing, I don't know if you heard of it, a kinder transport. My three oldest siblings went on a kinder transport to England. So that was only my brother next to me in age and my parents. And my father said, let them get settled and we came afterwards. But unfortunately, it never came. In 1939, my brother next to me and I, we went to Frankfurt to the Hirsch Realschule, which was an orthodox school. But unfortunately, again, a lot of teachers left, people, uh, students left, they went to England, they went to America, wherever. And we came back home. By 1941, the end of 42, my brother and I, we were home. But it was very hard. My, Martin, my brother, had to work out of town. And my father and I, on a Saturday, we had to clean the streets in our hometown. When we were finished, on one side, some Nazis came with horses or cows, and they let them make, and we had to clean up again. After a while in Frankfurt, it was very difficult. 
and it was time for me to learn my Pasha Bereshit. A teacher taught me Chazan Bereshit, and we all went home. My brother and I, my parents, my mother, and in the meantime, my grandmother moved in with us, and I started to daven and started to lioning. And we get a telegram that a transport left from, in Germany from the south, where to where nobody knew. And it, my bar mitzvah was over. A couple of weeks ago, we, or even before, we tried to figure out who the tense men were. We couldn't figure. A couple of weeks ago, again, my wife and I, we started to count, and we were 11 men. It was very difficult. My father couldn't go out and do any more business. The bank accounts were closed. You couldn't take no money off. But if every Nazi, every German would have been a Nazi, we wouldn't have survived. At night, some of the Gentiles threw us into the garden. On the left was a Nazi. On the right of the garden was a gentleman. On the end of the garden was also a, a gentleman who took care of us. I must say, I go back when our synagogue was destroyed. My father came, gave a memorial tablet to that gentleman where Jews, American soldiers, fought in the First World War and died in the First World War. And some of their relatives died in the concentration camp. My brother and I, we brought the memorial tablet after we came here and we have a library in Mount Sinai Jewish Center, like Dr. Schwartz mentioned before, where I'm a member. And we brought it over here with standing in the library. If anybody is interested, he's more than welcome to see it. Came closer and closer in 1942. My parents, my grandmother, and my brother we came to Theresienstadt in Czechoslovakia on the cattle car. We arrived there and we were split up, my brother and I, my parents and my grandmother. Theresienstadt was a small town and they, the Germans chased everybody out. I went into a children's home and my parents went into a small house with about 10 or 12 people. Unfortunately, I couldn't see my parents every day. There was a curfew. And a lot of times we went at night when the SS patrolled around with their dogs and we knew the neighborhood. We sneaked around and we saw our parents. We were there for 22 months. Since my father also fought in the First World War, they gave him a little bit courtesy. Every so often, they pulled out inmates and they put them in a cattle car and they went off. But nobody knew where they were going. All of a sudden, my father got notice that we are on the next transport 
to go out. Again, we didn't know where to go. My grandmother died in Theresienstadt. Unfortunately, my brother and I never could follow her where she is going. We went into the cattle car, my parents, my brother, and I. We came to a place as we drove in. We saw a sign, Arbeit macht Freit. I'm sure if, if you saw any of the movies, you saw that sign before. As they opened up the cars, my father over Sholem said, here we are where the others came already a long time ago. We lined up. We didn't know who it was. Later we found out it was Mengele. He put his finger into his coat or whatever he was wearing. He went like this or like this. My parents went on the left, my brother and I to the right. We had very little time to say anything. My, mother, my father said to my brother and me, you will make it. Your mother and I won't. Be proud of our name. If you look around, sometimes you see a car with a license plate spear. Some people say, look at those big shots. They drive with their names. I don't answer. My children don't answer. We went through a gate. I turned around. My brother was gone already. And we got a number, and I have it on my arm, 1838, and my brother has 1839. I don't think that my parents were tattooed. We marched into a barrack, and I saw the group which was on the left also marching. And I wanted to run over to my parents. And his, and his s man chased me over with a couple, a Jewish man. I didn't know who it was or what. I went into a barrack where there were a lot of inmates there already. In Germany, very few people spoke Yiddish, just like here, not every speaks Yiddish either. They spoke in Yiddish to me, and I didn't understand them. And they're starting to beat me up. Not hard. I had no idea why. The reason they beat me up, they call it the chip Lager where my parents were and so many others, and they were going out. You heard screaming, but they distracted me. The people in the barrack, they knew what went on. I was innocent, I didn't know. And after a while, I smelled the smoke. And the couple, which was a Jew, came over to me and he says, in half Yiddish and half German, he says, we didn't hit you, we didn't want to hurt you, but we want to distract you. Came daytime, the gypsy camp was empty, and I knew already that my parents were no longer alive. Regardless how many times I tell the story, 
it hurts. Maybe you don't understand. Like we had once J.J. Schachter and Christa Lachner with Schultz speaking, and he said, if you don't want in it, you won't believe it. I was alone. I was a young fella. A day later, again, we marched and we came to Sosnowitz which was a cannon factory. On one side there was a big piece of metal, one pushed it over and another one pushed it into an oven to put it together, which looked like bombs. We were innocent again, you had no chance. If you didn't do it fast enough, there was a Polish, man who wasn't a Jew, who only had a half an arm. If you didn't do fast enough, he pushed you right into the fire. And you saw that. You got to remember, on the oven, I don't know how many de degrees it is hot. In back of you, it's cold. People got ammonia. If we left the night shift or the day shift, maybe with a hundred or so, maybe half came back. That went on for a couple of weeks. One morning we came from the night shift and we saw the ones who worked in the day, day shift standing outside and we went next to it. And again, we didn't know. After a while, they blow the whistle in German, turn around, and we started to march. Later on, we found out there were roughly about 4,000 inmates, all Jews. Again, I was one of the youngest. We started to march, and as we were marching, we saw tanks laying on the side. We saw people laying on the floor. After a while, we saw it's our people. But you had no chance, no choice, but to keep on marching. And after a while, I saw the couple, the Jewish guy standing next to me with that captain who pushed me over into the barrack. I couldn't go in where my parents were. And the reason I survived, whenever the captain went for lunch or a break, when he came back, he shoved me a piece of bread. And he says, eat it in German, esses, and that's how I survived. And that young Allah, I found out the name, said, eat it and keep strong. Again, people were falling down. Sometimes you get brainless and selfish. You marched, your shoes were, born, were worn, you took the shoes off by somebody else and you put them on but you had to be fast, otherwise the SS, not the Captain Wolf, who was a couple of feet before me or in back of me, and he let me do it. If the, after a while he came and he gave me a jacket, it was raining, it was snowing. We started to march, and you turned around and the group got smaller and smaller. I think I was about in the middle. It got less and less. We started to march, and all of a sudden we saw a camp on top that was on the hill. We didn't know. We walked in there, tired, frozen through and through, 
no food, that Captain Wolf, who helped me to survive with the, with the Cabo Yengala. We walked into a barrack, and we tried to walk, warm up a little. Our clothes were wet. All of a sudden, an SS man came and pulled me out, and he put me into a room, and he put me over a table. You had your hands put stretched out, so you couldn't move, and the same thing with your feet. And they start hitting me, because since I was a little bit more, more solid, they wanted to find out why I survived. Would I have said that the German Nazi or SS man gave me part of his food, they would have killed him. And they had a whip, which even, and they kept on whipping me. Later on, out, later on, I found out that very few people came out of there alive. The reason why I came alive, we heard some whistles. And what were the whistles? There were bombs going into, we didn't know where, but later on we found out in Austria there were Linsenkrats. And the SS were afraid that they would come here and they ran off. But I was strapped in and I couldn't get out. Again, get Captain Wolf saw me going in, and he strapped me again, and I could get out. Would he, if, if he wouldn't have seen me, I never would have survived. By that time, I was beaten up. My back was completely red, uh, red black, green. I couldn't see it, but I couldn't move. He put me against the barrack. And all of a sudden, Mauthausen has big doors. I don't know if you saw any of those movies before. We saw the tanks going in. Who was it? What did we know? American soldiers or whatever. But we knew it was no SS Germans. There was no, none of them around except that Wolf, who was standing next to me. I was laying against the wall. Again, a man, a man in uniform came over to me and he said, I'm an American soldier and I will help you. Who was the American soldier? Captain Levy. In the meantime, the inmates, they were outside. The Red Cross came with food. They ate like nobody would. Uh, they were hungry. They just ate and ate. They got diarrhea. It was terrible. I think if the day or two Red Cross came, with hoses, they chased everybody out of the barracks. They sprayed and, and they got all the barracks clean. And all the people who survived, they washed down and they gave them new uniforms or clothes, whatever. I have some picture here where I still have the clothes on the picture. Again, that Captain Levy came to me and he says, he gave me little, very little food. I don't know what he gave me, but 
I got my strength a little by little, and he put me in, they call it a lazaret, which was from the cro uh, Red Cross, like a recovery room where the SS was, but in the, instead of the SS, it was the American, British, and thank God they got me back to my st strength back after a couple of days. One day, Captain Levy came to me and he says, tonight we got to move out because the Russians take over. Do you, do you have any place to go? It took me a couple of minutes to get my brain together, and I said to him, the last thing my father over Sholem said to me, we won't make it, you will make it, go back to your hometown. And I mentioned that to Captain Levy. So he says, I, I had no idea where my brother is. Is he alive? Isn't he alive? I know, I knew my parents weren't, unfortunately. He drove me in to Linz and put me on the train. And he said to conductor, this man will go to there and there. Make sure he gets there. Otherwise, he put his hand on the revolver and he says, if you don't, and if you don't, I'm going to get after you. I'm going to kill you. P.S. We went, I went on a coal train and we, I didn't know what town it was. Later on, I found out it was München. I got there, I got off the train, the conductor in German said to me, stay here, I'm going to get you to your hometown. I went into the bathroom, all I had was a shirt, and I went into the bathroom, and I start to wash up, and I put my shirt over whatever door or something. I washed myself. I turned around, my shirt was gone, so I'm just standing there in my shorts or whatever. Yeah, shorts. I waited till somebody else came and took his shirt off. I took his shirt and I put it on. If it fits or didn't fit, I didn't care. He brought me on the other side of the town. With the, there's a train from the small towns who work in Marburg, where I was there, where he dropped me off. And he said to the conductor, make sure that he goes near the town where he comes from. And I went over to the man and I spoke to him and I said, when is the next train going to Wittelsburg, which was about a, a mile away from our town? So he says, well, the train just came. The next one will go when they're finished working about five, six o'clock. And with the same breath, he said, you know, a couple of days ago, a young fellow, also a Yiddish young, which means a Jew, came and he asked the same questions. I knew right away it was my brother. He says, sit down, I get you coffee and wait till the next train goes. I said, I'm not going to wait. I started to walk. I was 
weak, I was tired. I came into the next town and I saw by that time it was about seven o'clock or whatever. I saw a bicycle standing there. I took the bicycle and I went into our town. I went into our house and the woman said, well, your brother is by a former mate or whatever, I don't remember exactly, because we are living here, couldn't get in. And I looked into the house and saw some of our furniture, but I was not yet ready to stay there. I went to the house and I knocked on the door. The woman opened up and she says, Walla, Walla. And she pu pulled me into a room and my brother is laying there sleeping. He opened up his eyes. The first thing he said, where's mama and papa? I couldn't tell him right away, but he kept on nudging me. He says, I'm glad you're alive, you're here, but where are our parents? So finally, I told them. I had no idea if my other siblings who left before the war to England. Martin got up. We had coffee and went to our house and whoever the Gentiles were, we chased them out. No, you can't do that, you can't do that. We give you 10 minutes to go out, otherwise we're going to throw you out. Sure enough, they all got out and we went into our building. We were there for about a year. The German government sent people, what do you call it, who used to work for the government. They brought us food and clothes and everything. I must say there was a man who left before the war to America. And Martin said to me, Friedel, the same man, is in the American army. He just, he just left yesterday and he's coming back tomorrow. Sure enough, Friedel came the next day. In between, my brother said that Julius and Alfred are in England and Edith is in America. And that Captain Levy was always in touch with us. Either he sent one of his men or he came what you need and everything. We were there for a while and we knew we wouldn't stay here because to us we figured everybody would be a Nazi. But in the meantime, a gentleman's farmer came and he says to me or to us, you know, I have the tablet which your father gave me which the, with the name of the soldiers who died in the First World War. He gave it to us and we put it in our cemetery. The non-Nazi were very nice. I'm skipping something because if I wanted to go piece by piece, we would be sitting here till two, three o'clock this afternoon. And we put it on our cemetery. The government found out that we want to leave. The next day, a, a car came, a man like a chauffeur. You know, the government wants to see you. you. I should pick you up and come to Marburg. 
where I was left off when I came from camp. And we said, if the governor wants to see us, let him come to us. He took off. A couple hours later, and he begged us to go. And he went in there. There's some people sitting there from the bank and all kind of big shots. And they said, don't leave. Why don't you take your father's business over? My father, which I didn't even know, I was uh, a child. We had land, we had orchids, and we had wood. And we said to him, where were you when we left? You can take Germany and shove it. P.S. we left. A month later, we came to America. In the meantime, that Captain Levy put an ad, there were a day, I don't think uh, if it's still an existing, put an ad in the German Aufbau. And my sister worked in a glove factory and the woman said, uh, you know, there's an ad there that Walter Spear is looking for his, his sister and brother. Naturally, she got very excited. My sister picked us up on the, we came to America on the pier. My sister got, was married. She lived in a one-bedroom apartment. We went in there. My brother looks at me. I look at my brother. Where are we going to sleep? One night, my brother slept on the couch. I slept on the floor. The next night, we switched. We weren't very happy, but we couldn't insult my sister. We looked in the outbow, and we got a job. My brother started to work at swing line for a dollar an hour, and I started to work in a machine shop for 75 cents an hour. An hour. After a while, we had a relative who was in the non-culture meat business, and he came and he says, you know, I can take one of you. My brother was making 75 cents, a dollar an hour. I was making 75 cents an hour. So I started to work on the butcher. That was in July or August. Came the high holidays. The foreman came and you had to pull matches. The first day they were closed on the Rosh Hashanah. The second day they were open. You had to pull matches. Now I don't know exactly. If you pull one match, you have to, you could stay home the first day and you get paid for two days came to me. Is that for me? Came to me to pull. I said, I didn't come to America to work on Yondav. The foreman whistled in my ear, I'm proud of you. Came Friday afternoon, payday, they pulled me into the office. He had a brother, a partner, another gentleman. And the Stickel Mishpocha said to me, and I wasn't Shoma Shabbos yet, he said to me, Walter, with how much money did you come over here? I said, what are you, crazy? With tears in his eyes, and he says, I guarantee you one thing. I never 
keep the place open again on yonder. If you have the nerve or the guts not to work on the yonder, I give you all the credit in the world. I look in my envelope, the paycheck, there was a $5 raise. Now don't forget, that was in 1946. $5 was a lot of money. And I said to Julius at the same time, look, I was brought up Orthodox. I know I'm not yet, but I have all the intentions to go back the way I was brought up. So he says, Walter, if you want to go into the kosher meat business, you need money, I back you up 100%. After a couple of weeks, I left and I started to work in a kosher butcher in Yonkers. There were two partners and they also knew I'm not going to stay. There was a store for sale. I bought the store, and I got the hashkocha from Rabbi Rosenberg, who was, at that time, the head of the OU. And I went to him, and I said, Rabbi, I want you hashkocha. And we sat down, and I told him exactly what happened, that I wasn't Shoma Shabbos, I was brought up, I told him my story. We sit down, we talked, he, he called the wife or whatever, he brought us coffee and he says, Mr. Spear, the way you talked, you got my blessing. And I was the only one in Yonkers who had no Mashiach in the place. I was the only one at that time, there were about five or six kosher butchers. I must say, before I opened up the store, I got married. I m married a wonderful wife. We are married for 66 years. We have... I'm sorry. I got married, we, have, we raised two wonderful children, and they got married to two wonderful wives. Between them, they have two five grandchildren, we have five grandchildren, we have six great-grandchildren, they all went to yeshiva, they all from, they all keep kosher, we have one on the way yet, and I always say, God was not good to me in my life, but I never left you, like I say, in the morning, you say, in Tachlun, God, I never f forgot you. Now, don't forget me now. And believe me, he didn't forget me now. We are happy. I retired 18 years ago. We live a good life. We got no complaints, my wife and I. And we enjoy it. And I hope everyone here gets something out of it, even if it's hard and you go up or down. Don't give up Judaism because God is always with you especially what went on today. Don't be silent, because Hitler tested the world in 1938 with Kristallnacht, and all the Jews all over, all over the world kept quiet. And that's why six million died. And please, I beg everyone, look, today I'm an old man, I'm 91 years old, fight, I'm not worried about myself or my wife, even my children, but I'm worried about my grandchildren and great-grandchildren that it never should happen, happen again. And it's up to you, with you and your parents and all your mishpoche, it should never happen again. 
Thank you for listening to me. Some of you may know one of Mr. Spear's grandchildren, his grandson, Rabbi Jay-Z Spear, who teaches in Frisch and is in Camp Morasha. To conclude today's program, thank you so much, Mr. Spear, for those incredibly powerful words. I want to let you know that at some point, Mr. Spear's family actually tracked down the family of Captain Levy, and they met and they got to know each other. Captain Levy has a granddaughter who is a university professor in Texas, where she teaches Holocaust education. To conclude today's program, we are going to ask Adam Nirenberg to come up and say the prayer for the American military. As some of you may know, my uncle, Major Stuart Adam Wolfer, served in the United States Army. While on his second deployment, the gym in which he was working out in was struck by an enemy mortar and he was tragically killed in action alongside Colonel Stephen Scott. At the time, my uncle was working to coordinate the Multinational Security Transition Command, which worked with the Iraqi military and government to help create and train a new Iraqi leadership. We can continue to honor his legacy by supporting our troops. My family and I have started a charity, the Major Stuart Adam Wolfer Institute, which sends care packages to troops in his memory. These events have made me appreciate veterans and all that their service truly means to our country. With this in mind, I will now say the prayer for the safety of the American military forces. Almighty God on high, omnipotent King, look down from your sanctified abode and bless the valiant soldiers of the American military forces who risk their lives to protect the welfare of all your creation. Benevolent God, be their shelter and fortress and do not allow them to falter. May harmony dwell in their ranks, victory in their battalions. Fill their hearts with faith and courage to thwart the evil schemes of our enemies and to abolish every rule of evil. Protect them on land, in the air, and in the sea, and destroy their adversaries. Guide them in peace, lead them toward peace, and return them speedily to their families, alive and unharmed, as it is written. God will shield you from all evil. He will guard your soul. God will safeguard your departure and arrival from now and forevermore. Grant us true peace and fulfillment of the prophecy. Nations shall not lift up sword against another nation, nor shall they learn war anymore. Let all the inhabitants of the world know that dominion is yours, and your name inspires awe upon all that you have created. May this be our will, and let us say, Amen.